out on the water and around town with our host, Chris Evans. Hello, it's Chris Emmons talking to you from the fabulous Florida Keys. I'm so glad you joined me. Remember, we're on a road trip. We've been being on a road trip for a few episodes and we got more to go. Your aim is to visit the Florida Keys or think about visiting or maybe move. Or if you're a local, you wanna know some neat places to go to. And I'm a great host for you to show you because I've been down here for decades. I'm a pharmacist and um, that's kind of what I do nine to five. And then I love mini adventures. So off I go mini adventuring during all these years. You're lucky because you get to enjoy that. You can reach me so we can be in touch and you know what's happening with the Explore the Keys with Chris Emmons show at the Facebook page that I just dragged myself into new technology and it is called um, Explore the Keys with Chris Evans. And you can also write me and if you write me, my email address is Chris, C-H-R-I-S, at MarathonFloridaTV.com. I'm so happy that you're going to join us, and I'll tell you why, because I think you're going to be so happy that you did. I am ready to go. I am geared up. Are, are you geared up? I hope so. Please, get a pen and a paper, because I have so much information. I have so many websites, and I want you to be able to corral this information so that it will be yours. I love you and let's get started. One, two, three. Draped off the bottom of the state of Florida are 1,700 islands scattered out like a jeweled necklace. They are called the Florida Keys and the road that leads to and along them is US-1. Highway US-1 in the Florida Keys begins at about mile marker 126-127, just under the southernmost mainland of the state of Florida and continues to its end point at mile marker zero on the westernmost island of Key West. We have a US-1 highway because there used to be a railroad that bridged 42 of the islands. The railway began at the uppermost island, Key Largo, and ended at the westernmost, Key West. It was built by Henry Flagler between 1905 and 1912, and roads for automobiles were added in 1928. Without the US-1 road being built, we would not be able to visit these islands, enjoy their tropical weather and vegetation, stunning water views, or the wildlife here. Having the ability to travel these islands strewn under the state of Florida is what causes this whole area to be an ultimate destination. The islands run southerly off the bottom of the state of Florida, and the further south you go, they run more westerly than southerly. The keys are generally divided into four categories. The upper keys, the middle keys, the lower keys, and the outlying islands. That would be the islands accessible only by boat. Along the US-1 highway are small rectangular green with white numbered signs adjacent to both sides of the highway that tell approximately how far you are from Key West. They are called mile markers, and locals use them when giving directions. As we drive south on US-1, the Gulf of Mexico, also called the Bay, is on our right side, and the Atlantic Ocean on our left side. When giving directions to the Florida Keys, both the mile marker number and the side of the island are used as reference points. So, mile marker 90.6 Bayside would mean that the location is between mile marker 91 and 90 on the Bayside, on the right side as we head south. During our road trip together, we head towards mile marker 60 in the Middle Keys. Mile marker 60 is the northernmost boundary to the city of Marathon and its sister city, the city of Key Colony Beach, is further south about seven miles. Along our road trip together, you will visit neat places I've discovered during my very long stay in the fabulous Florida Keys. The island of Key Largo is the first island in the chain of islands called the Florida Keys and it runs approximately 16 miles along US-1. Key Largo does have another more northern section with a road that branches off US-1 at about mile marker 107 and dead ends at two extremely exclusive communities. They are the Ocean Reef Club and the Anglers Club. As we leave Key Largo and tool south along US-1 towards our destination, we cross an overpass about 15 feet above the water called the Tavernier Creek Bridge. Just past the bridge is a sign in the median that welcomes us to the Islands of Isla Mirada, known to locals as Isla Mirada. 
The welcome sign is on Plantation Key at mile marker 90.7, and it marks the northernmost boundary to this village of islands in the Florida Keys. US-1 traverses these islands southerly for 27 miles and crosses four of the five islands that comprise the islands of Isla Morada. The islands from north to south include Plantation Key, Windley Key, Upper Matacumbe Key, Lower Matacumbe Key, and a private island off US-1 that has historically been called Tea Table Key. Our destination is a very short one-tenth of a mile south of the Welcome to Isla Morada sign. Here is the location of the Plantation Key Tropical Nature Preserve and Children's Memorial Tree Garden. A hidden jewel not known by many. It's about four acres and includes wonderful things like a butterfly garden and park benches, a launch area for paddle type crafts, mulched walking trails, and is where trees are planted as tribute to children whose lives were cut short. This nature preserve is at mile marker 90.6. This is a beautiful place. It's at mile marker 90.6. You cross the Tavernier Creek Bridge and you make an immediate right. And that would be right by the marina, Tavernier Marina. And then as soon as you make the right, make an immediate left into this memorial park. This is a children's memorial park. And what we're looking at are trees that have been planted by the parents as a commemoration to their children. And also when they come to visit the tree, they can remember their child without going to a cemetery. And the tree in some way is part of the healing process because the memories, the wonderful memories, they, they're kind of tied with this living tree. So when you come to the park, you really get it that um, there's love here. And I want to share this with you. It's very zen and in the park there are seats for you to sit on and the high school became involved in the park and their construction classes would come here and they built a gazebo for the park and then they planted extra vegetation and the park is well groomed there's places to sit it's right next to the canal so there's a water feel and it is someplace worth stopping and sitting and contemplating. But what I contemplate, the important things in life. The fact that what's really important after all said and done is our emotional connections, because every possibility in life starts with an emotional connection that you have had with another. And this brings it home, you know, like right here where it is felt. It's beautiful, it takes you to a deep place, and I'm reminded that when you're down here on your visit in Marathon, and you're driving down, and you're in the Florida Keys, be nice to your loved one. That's your emotional connection. They're your beloved. Be beloved to them. Expect them to be beloved to you. And if you're down with friends, those are your emotional connections. Make the most of them. This is the gazebo that the high school students from Coral Shores, less than half a mile further south, built for the Children's Memorial Garden. It's very, very nice. It was a nice thought on their part. Throughout the park, there are also concrete benches to set on. The breeze is nice. The trees are developed. So do stop by and experience the peace that's here on your way down further into the Keys as we travel towards the Islands of Marathon, our marker 60.
are cruising south on US-1 in the Florida Keys, and our next stop is about six miles south at another kind of park. Okay, we're at mile marker 84.9, and we're at the Windley Key Fossil Reef at Geological State Park. And this is a wonderful park to come to because of the history involved. When Henry Flagler was building the railway, he needed to raise it up. And what was he going to use to raise it up? He went to the quarry, created this as a quarry, and he cut out pieces of the coral reef, the ancient coral limestone reef. Hence, this is a limestone quarry. And when you go here, you'll actually see some of his old equipment that was kind of left behind. So you can see the saws that they would cut. And some of the pits in there are as high as eight feet deep because they would cut slices. The quarry was actually closed in 1960. And there's something called keystone. Uh, well, you know, this would be keystone. This is coral, and it is cut into slabs. And so what buildings would have to decorate them is they would put facings of keystone, which is the cut, old, ancient, fossilized limestone, coral bed. And so this has got a lot of history. Now, their sign says that they're closed, I think, Tuesday and Wednesday, and then they're open till five o'clock the other days. So as you're driving, it's on the bay side, 84.9. Just pull right in and go see a piece of history. We are cruising south on US-1 in the Florida Keys and our next stop is the Library Beach Park at mile marker 81.5 Bayside. Bayside means the park will be on the right side of US-1 as we travel south. Here we discover a small secluded beach and lagoon within a hidden park located on Upper Matacumgee Key, one of the five islands that comprise the islands of Isla Morada. We stopped at mile marker 81.5. We're in Isla Morada, and we're behind the library that you will see at mile marker 81.5. It's a 1960s looking library, brick, easy to miss, so keep your eyes sharp. Turn, go right next to the library building, and it'll take you in the back where there is what is called the library park. And I told you to consider wearing a bathing suit because this is one of the places that you can take a swim. In this channel, there is a current, especially when the tides change, but it's very sandy and it's very nice for just wading or taking a little dip. The sandy beach is the main attraction at the Library Beach Park, although its well-tended grounds boast a small playground with swings for the kids and a shaded picnic area with permanent grills. There are bathroom facilities and a really nice addition is its outside showers. Since we are here among the village of islands called Isla Morada, I feel you may enjoy knowing the history behind its name, Isla Morada. A story is told that early Spanish explorers way back in the 16th century came to this area and were visually taken by hazy sunsets which lit up the sky with the color purple. Yes, yes, there are purple haze sunsets. And when this happens, the color in the sky is totally ethereal looking. In short, purple haze sunsets are spectacular. And if you have ever had an opportunity to see one, you will understand why early explorers called these islands Islas Moradas, which in Spanish translates to purple islands. As time went by, Islas Moradas was angolized to Isla Morada, and this is the inflection used today. I always enjoy a visit to the Library Beach Park in Isla Morada at mile marker 81.5, and I felt you would like to know that it is here. You can come for a wade when you get down here, or when you move down here, 
But until then, you can be here vicariously. I'm walking in the water for you. Here, have some. <laughs> water feels good. Are you having fun yet? This beach is a nice location for snorkeling along the mangrove trees during slack tide because of the mecca of marine life that's here. We are meandering south together down Highway US-1 in the Florida Keys as I show you sights I have enjoyed. We are together driving along US-1 in the Florida Keys and right now we are within the village of islands called the Islands of Isla Morada and known to locals as Isla Morada, heading towards mile marker 78. At mile marker 78.5, we cross the Indian Key Channel Bridge and beside it on the ocean side, that would be the left side as we head south, you will see a small, less than nine acre island. This is our destination, historic Indian Key. Hello, we're at mile marker 78 and we're right next to this bridge called the Indian Key Channel Bridge. This is a very historic area. Behind me is a key called Indian Key and then just further north of it, out there, is a key called Tea Table Key. There is great history here and we're gonna go down the rabbit hole and share it with you. In between these cars, you know, there's a lot of cars, we're right by US-1 and not only are we right by US-1, but this is spring break. But we love all the tourists because they're fun. They bring stories from yonder. You bring some stories with you when you come too, okay? Back to Indian Key and Tea Table. You can go to the website, keyshistory.org, and read a whole bunch about it there. Meanwhile, let's go down this rabbit hole of information about history of these two keys and enjoy knowing what we're going to learn. I'm so ready for this. During the 1800s, Indian Key, the Oceanside Island off the Indian Key Channel Bridge, was a bustling town with about 50 inhabitants and 40 buildings. Today, it houses only the Indian Key Historic State Park. Here is its story. In the 1830s, Indian Key housed the first settlement in the Florida Keys, and its beginnings stemmed from a unique business opportunity caused by the shallow waters found in this area. Shallow reefs are all along this stretch and ships who inadvertently hit them during storms or in the darkness then floundered and were battered by waves. So the Indian Key community settlers began a wrecking business and salvaged cargo from these shipwrecks. Hmm. Salvaging was so prosperous that in 1836, tiny Indian Key held the prestigious title as county seat for Dade County. Today, the Florida Keys are part of Monroe County and that occurred in 1866. But 30 years earlier, the Keys were part of Dade County and tiny Indian Key was Dade's first county seat. Hmm, this was a huge accomplishment for a small area of land in the water out in Nowheresville, but all that ended four years later on August 7, 1840, and the ending was violent. It was early, early morning on August 7, 1840, smack dab in the middle of the Second Seminole War, a war with the local Indians which ran from 1835 to 1842, when a large party of Indians, recorded at as many as 200, sneaked onto the west coast of Indian Key. The Indians' raid was well coordinated and the only reason for any survivors was that one man was actually awake at that hour. The inhabitants of Indian Key, those that were able to anyway, fled to the naval base on nearby Tea Table Key. That would be the little key just east of Indian Key. Tea Table Key is a small three and a half acre mangrove covered island which in 1838 had a fort established on it named Fort Paulding after James Kirk Paulding, who was the U.S. Secretary of the Navy. <laughs> it was a very small fort by fort standards on a very small island, 
and its structures consisted of two post coconut thatched roof formations. This was the home base for two of the Navy ships. They were used to patrol the waters of the Florida Keys. At the time of the Indian attack, the personnel of the naval base were gone, sent on an expedition to the Everglades, and certainly the Indians knew the fort was deserted. A total of five able-bodied men and seven or eight sick men were left on Tea Table Key, and this was too few hands to combat the attacks. So the Indians completely looted the town on Indian Key and then burned it to the ground. The assault on Indian Key may have been predicated by something the Indians learned about which would destroy their civilization. A proposition had been suggested to the governor about five months earlier on March 16, 1840 to offer the astonishing amount of a $200 bounty for each Indian caught or killed. These were desperate times during the Second Seminole War, both for us and the Indians. I feel sorry for the settlers, and I also can't blame the Indians for being angry. Keyshistory.org is a great website, isn't it? And reading it makes you want to get down here and get on Indian Key yourself with your feet. I'd like to share that a mile down the road on the right on the bay side is Robbie's Marina. And at Robbie's you can rent a kayak or hire a captain to get you over to Indian Key. <laughs> it's all good, isn't it? I love you. Congratulations, you wore out your tour guide. I have got to take a break. When we come back on our next episode, we will pick up where we left off. But for right now, I gotta take a break. I gotta chill, relax, get something to drink. I know we saw an awful lot coming down from the stretch and we're gonna see an awful lot more. Until then, you imagine what you're gonna do when you get down to the marathon area and you're driving towards it. Or you imagine when you do get down here, what you're gonna do. Or how about when you move? Until then, I'm gonna find myself something cool to drink, enjoy the sunset and the water, and I'm gonna read my favorite book. You go do something fun now, and I'll see you next time on the Explore the Keys with Chris Emmons Show. Later, Gators.